there are a variety, as is well known, of meditations that are prevalent in Kabbalistic practice, some of them being far more leaning into common Judaism than they are to the mysticism that we would expect of it. And then one in particular is known as Hidbodadut, which is mostly a secluded activity, a singular one. Yet, we note that it has a lot of expressions about it. It has a lot of expectations in which whenever you perform it properly, not only is there a particular almost ecstatic revelation, but there also tends to be a sense of unity. Not just between you and the divinity. Not to say that that's any shorthanded conception at all, right? But that it includes worldliness to the extent that you feel reintegrated into what it is that you're dealing with. Unsurprisingly, this is a lot like most styles of mindfulness. It's a lot like yoga. We find time and time again, in stepping back, so too do we feel interconnected. Kind of one of those funny little paradoxical scenes. And in some manner, I like to suspect that there's a grand metaphysical conception behind why this occurs. Or at least an understanding in the basis of human psychology for why this occurs. But... In the most particularly spiritual manner, I like to believe that it comes from really from a reduction in one's external pressures, right? We might say general stressors, general engagements, all these little things in life that kind of cloud our vision. And I think in most things in occultism and esotericism, we find that the idea of a cloudy vision is often brought down to the signs of worldliness. Even the conceptions of the Klepothic forces being almost as if they are perversions of the Sphorothic forces, but they are husks and shells that cover them and garment them, creating new barriers and new, you know, struggles, so to say, to deal with. And with all those things considered, it's as if being at least in the moment with yourself, even if you're getting theological and trying to, you know, cleave to the divinity, you're kind of slowly peeling back those husks, pulling back on those issues. I've often seen this described as a particular style of, we might say, development. And it can be used in almost all spaces, be it education, intellectual pursuits in general, emotional shifts, worldly changes even then, and also just our own growth. This particular metaphor that I just referenced is that the Divine Presence reveals itself ever so slowly, and I have mentioned this in the Thoughts on Kabbalah video, but it reveals itself ever so slowly, and then it'll go a little bit further time and time again. And in one way, when we go through the phases of development, understanding that there's a lot of fluctuation there, we might say we climb up, we come down, and all of this is for the sake of perspective. All of this is for the sake of tempering and changing. Because, as I've mentioned quite a lot in these my thoughts on and live stream videos, that all change is going to require this tempering process. And tempering, of course, is being met with fire and then being cooled. It's kind of a simple metaphor, but still a very valid one, and one that we must understand. And with time, hopefully, the expectation is that a particular level of control develops. Now, that might sound like a tangent to you, so we're going to have to stop and come back to the meditation that's being discussed. Is there a temperance in this? Well, of course there is. Look at the signs. If you are engaged in worldliness, and then you are pulled out of it, and then you go back in after revelation, and then hopefully have a new one, you just back and forth. And this back and forth rotation is going to create an entirely new paradigm, an entirely new level of understanding of what it is that we look at and how we deal with things. It shifts our perspective. But the thing is that all change, most some will say, is good. I disagree. I think when it comes to change, if there's no intention or focus, then we can become astray. We can be led down certain paths that can otherwise be detrimental to us. And shoot, What's kind of funny is we often walk ourselves down that path. If we want to look at occultism more directly, 
really specifically at these kinds of styles, at least what I'm discussing from a psychological perspective, we should note that you, <laughs> in magic especially, have to focus it, right? You have to, let's say you're using your wordings and your phrasings and everything like that. There is a direction there. You are at least decreeing to some degree what it is that you're trying to do. It's not always so willy-nilly. Even the chaos tends to follow these kinds of rules in their most simplistic form. And by simplistic, I don't mean necessarily simple, I mean refined. Which is, again, one of the reasons why I kind of respect that style. So, I implore the variety of you to take a moment of self-reflection. I suspect many of you already do and have your own practices and ideas and everything like that that you engage in for the sake of grounding or what have you, whatever you want to call it. But I think with all things, much like myself, there always is time and space for a little bit of self-reflection. One final thing. When it does come to change, many of us do not fear change for change's sake as much as we are worried about loss. We're worried about losing what we have. But there is a grand expansion and a grand expression that comes from internal development because you never know what's resting around the corner. Very classic, kind of cringy commentary, I'll admit, but that doesn't make it untrue. And beyond that, it's kind of hard for me to defend this type of practice a little bit considering uh, that many people were locked away in their houses for so many months. But I think, again, it comes with that balance. Ultimate seclusion is destructive. Ultimate expression is destructive. All right, everyone, this has been River at the Nimiton. Thanks for joining. A massive thank you to my friends, patrons, and supporters. I appreciate you more than you know, and I'll see you next time.